Alma Diamond is a doctoral candidate at NYU School of Law, where she's working under the supervision of Professor Jeremy Waldron on issues in, on issues in general jurisprudence in public law. Her scholar interests span contract theory and law, constitutional law, and ethics. At NYU School of Law, Alma has previously served as senior articles editor at the NYU Review of Law and Social Change and is currently a co-chair of the African Law Association. The topic of her presentation is Law Beyond the State. Or there is a question mark, Law Beyond the State? I was thinking I should have removed the question mark, but here we are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, this is going to be quintessential armchair philosophy. I don't have any slides. I'm just going to talk through my ideas. Um, and also, I've been having so much fun at this conference. I've had a lot of coffee. So <laughs> I hope I can remember to speak slowly enough. Let me just start the timer. Right. So thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for being here to Danny and Ido and the team for arranging this stimulating conference. I'm really grateful to be here to learn from a range of thinkers in this wide variety of fields. It's a really interesting experience to listen to everyone. Um, on the one hand, it's great to learn about all these things that I don't know about. On the other hand, it's really overwhelming to know how much I don't know. Um, but it's also encouraging to know that there are people all around the world thinking about these really important things that I know nothing about. And that's the thing I like to think that's really special about human beings, is that we can share ideas. After today's conference, I will have new insights about literature and intergenerational trauma. I know something new about the links or the complexity of the links between biology and chemistry. And these are things that I'll know for the rest of my life, hopefully. Um, and what's even more, there are so many things in my life that rely on ideas that I don't even begin to understand. Ideas that make my computer work and my phone work and the coffee that I just drank. Um, and the sharing of ideas is a little bit like magic. It makes us capable of incredible things, um, horrible things, and pretty great ones as well. But it's not only that human beings can share ideas, it's also that we can use our ideas to create powerful things out of thin air. Um, the Thomas theorem tells us that what we define as real have real consequences. Um, and it's with this that I think we become capable of something very close to real magic. Um, think of money, for example. The money that you have with you are random bits of matter, perhaps a few pieces of paper, perhaps a coin or two, mostly probably it's data somewhere on the server. Um, but these random bits of matter have extremely real consequences because of the shared idea that we have. You can translate this data or coins or paper or whatever into um, anything or mostly anything. You can buy a computer, you can buy a meal, you can um, pay someone's salary. Um, and the idea, I think, or the takeaway there is just that shared idea, shared beliefs in an idea, if it's shared widely enough, becomes extremely real and extremely powerful. And that's what my research is about, um, but primarily about one such shared idea, law. My research question centers around a hunch that I have, and it's a hunch that we tend to forget that law is a shared idea. We tend to think and act and talk as if law simply is its real consequences. States and conventions, legislatures and courts, police officers, prisons, statutes, treaties and constitutions. We forget that these things are only law because of ideas that we share. A constitution, very much like money, is just a random bit of paper. And a prison, without our idea of law, is indistinguishable from a concentration camp. And I suspect that when we neglect this truth, this truth that law is a fact about shared ideas and not a fact about any particular institution or person or procedure, um, we make the mistake of forgetting that it's us, human beings, just general, that make and do law. We act as if it's something that states do. We talk as if it's our national government that passed the legislation or a UN convention that creates law. And this is not wrong as such, but it gets the explanation in the wrong direction. These bodies can only make law or only create law because of our, the contents of our law, law that's created by us. And um, national governments or UN conventions are just buildings full of people um, without our ideas of law. So it seems to me that in the past 100 years or so, um, we have become so used to another really relatively recent idea, the idea of the sovereign nation state, that we've come to confuse it with our idea of law. And I suspect that this is a confusion that matters a great deal. 
So I want to just share a thought experiment example with you to illustrate this, um, something that would work much better if we were in a room and I was just not talking to my own face. Um, but imagine we were in a room together and I can ask you to raise your hand if you are in support of the pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong. If you did raise your hand, let's say somebody did raise their hand, um, you were contradicting China's new national security legislation, legislation that they passed in June of this year. It's a crime and it's a crime punishable by imprisonment. Perhaps their officers stand ready to arrest you. And yet for some reason, you're probably still listening to me and you're not barricading your door. You, you're, this, this strikes you as a thought experiment and not as a real possibility. The question is why? Now, you might say that you're not subject to Chinese law, so you shouldn't care about this legislation. But the act itself would prove you wrong. Article 38 of that legislation explicitly states that it applies to all persons, to everyone on earth. So here is the question. Why are you not barricading your door? Why do you not think you committed a crime, even if Beijing might say that you have? An intuitive answer that I often um, encounter is that you're not in China, so you're not bound by Chinese law. But that's not quite right, of course. Chinese citizens are bound by Chinese law even when they're outside of the country, very much like I'm bound by South African law even while I'm living in the US. Um, that can't be the reason you're not afraid of being arrested for um, supporting these pro-democracy protests. And if you ask lawyers about this, they'd say that China has jurisdiction over its citizens, but not over you. So you don't have to worry, there's no jurisdiction. But notice that this is not an answer at all. Jurisdiction only exists because law exists. Trying to explain this in terms of jurisdiction is like saying everything China can do legally is law. It's like saying the $20 bill in your pocket is money because money is $20 bills. Another option we can have is to explain jurisdiction in terms of something else. Of course, we can't use borders because that's also just a legal idea. But perhaps we can do, talk about the actual people, the citizens. And we can say that this law is binding or that a state has jurisdiction over the, those citizens who accept its authority, who listen to its police officers, um, who pay taxes. But that won't quite work. We tend to believe that the state has authority, especially over those citizens who do not pay taxes and who do not accept its authority. Um, for instance, in Xinjiang province of China, there are Uyghur dissidents who do not accept Chinese authority. And for the most part, they are in prison. And in this case, we don't seem to doubt Chinese legal authority. So what is the difference between you and the dissident? It's the only difference that China can arrest the dissident and cannot arrest you. That surely can't be right. If China did abduct you in the middle of the night, that wouldn't make it legal. We can't be that everything that a state can do is legal simply because they can do it. Then we have no way to make sense of illegal state action, of which there are many examples. Just look at the court role in any constitutional Supreme Court around the world today. We might respond and say that either this is a silly example of something that just happened or that I'm overinterpreting the statute, but we would then be guilty of having very short memories, dangerously short memories. Only four or 500 years ago, Spanish conquistadors landed on the coast of South America and proclaimed their legal authority over all the indigenous communities there. Um, and their claims of authority, however frictional, became incredibly real very, very quickly. And today we don't seem to doubt the existence of the nation states that live or exist um, in the shadow of that conquest. The puzzle is this thing, this is the research theme. We tend to think that law is something created by states, but we forget that states are created by law and that we create law. And law is created by us is perhaps the best way, better way of saying it. And how do we create law? That essentially is my research question. Um, and the answer I think lies somewhere in social ontology. Um, I'm not gonna present my theories about the answer at the moment, but what I've hoped, hoped to have done in this presentation and in the last two minutes um, is share one, one option that doesn't work. We cannot explain law in terms of nation states. It may be that law is only the thing nation states do and what legislatures decide, but that is only true if we share that idea. And very importantly, that idea is not shared all around the world. Uh, to quote Lena's wonderful earlier presentation, the way things are is not how they must be. So one upshot of this insight is that there are many parts of the world which to Western state-centric thought looks lawless or stateless or like failed states, that there are in fact just other forms of legal organization. Another upshot closer to home 
is that we might actually realize that there's law and legal practices all around us in our direct communities, maybe in Facebook's so-called new Supreme Court, um, maybe in the conduct of massive multinational corporations. Perhaps accepting the T's and C's of a new privacy agreement is more like voting than we think. And I think that this is an empowering insight. If we remember that law exists in human minds, we can also recognize that it can be changed. We have in the past changed our minds. We've changed our minds about the church and about empires, about colonialism, about human rights. I'm not saying we have to change our minds about the law or about states, but I think it's important to realize that these things are malleable and that they are our products. We are not necessarily the victims. And I think, although my research is not strictly about this, that this changes how we think about our governments and their relationship to us. I think it changes the meaning of political engagement, of civic action, of our moral responsibility towards our immediate communities. Many have written, and I've also experienced, how 2020 makes us feel powerless at the mercy of our governments, governments that we can't trust. It might be useful to remember this perspective, a perspective in which we are the lawmakers responsible for our states and responsible for their failures too. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to the other presentations as well.